Thanks so much for that introduction. Um, I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a sense of my background and, and where I come from. When I graduated college, I was really, really passionate about artificial intelligence. I loved artificial intelligence. I worked for um, Yahoo, helping them classify web pages. So we would crawl millions of web pages, and we would take thousands of data points, aspects of the page. Does this page have a semicolon? Is the picture on the top of the page or the bottom of the page? All these details. And we would figure out things like, is this page spam? Is this page news? And it would help people when they came to Yahoo find uh, the things they were looking for when they did search, come up with the perfect results. And I really believe that artificial intelligence was this incredibly powerful tool that would, that would make our world better. Um, from there, I started a company called Crowdflower. And I still haven't completely explained to my mom what it does, so I'm not going to try to completely do that here. But, but basically, we take millions of jobs, hundreds of millions of jobs, actually, and we send it out to um, millions of people around the world, so tiny, tiny little jobs um, that people work on. And so I've spent a lot of time um, in those two worlds dealing with um, automation and labor and thinking about um, how they affect each other. Um, but I kind of I wanted to make... I want to throw out an idea today, which is that maybe automation and labor aren't mutually exclusive. Maybe automation actually doesn't lead um, to a loss of jobs. And the thing that gave me this idea was actually talking to my, my little cousin about a book that he was reading in school called um, Player Piano, which is a book that I actually loved. I was kind of curious, how many people have actually read Player Piano? OK, a bunch of you, cool. Um, so it's this book that, that um, was written in the 40s, and it describes this dystopian future where tons and tons of work has been automated, right? So all the kind of manufacturing jobs are gone. There's only just a few people that are kind of in charge of doing the automation, right? You can see why this is compelling to me as a teenager interested in um, artificial intelligence. Um, and so the only jobs left are really, it's like bartenders and people in charge of building AI systems, right? <laughs> and, and so, and, and so you, it, it, but it, it it makes you realize that, you know, I think some people in this techno-utopian Silicon Valley might be thinking, oh, if we could automate everything, that would be great, right? I mean, just that, you know, it might hurt for the person that loses their job, but, um, you know, there's sort of the greater good that's served by that. But I think most of us would, would really worry about that, right? And as a, a company that, you know, it has 60 real employees and millions of virtual people doing work for us, um, I certainly feel, and I think most of you would agree, that um, jobs is more than a paycheck, right? It's really important that... Um, people have, worth, have useful work they can do. And so thinking about this book, it's incredibly prescient, right? I mean, this was written before computers were invented, and he's imagining all this automation that we've actually built, right? I mean, our manufacturing systems actually use lots of robotics and artificial intelligence. It's a, it's a reality in our business. Um, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's replaced lots of jobs. And I'm not sure if it hasn't replaced lots of jobs if there's a whole bunch of jobs that are about to go away, right? And so I actually made a, um, a graph of the U.S. unemployment rate. I mean, you can find this data online, and I, I just graphed it in Excel. And, and it seems like, well, maybe the unemployment rate's going up a little bit. Um, you know, but, but if you think about all the jobs that have been lost due to automation, it's kind of incredible that it's not higher, right? Like, I was thinking the job computer, when Kurt Vonnegut wrote this book, was actually a human being. Right? It was like people that would calculate stuff. And so certainly there's no human computers anymore. Right? The job of computer has definitely been completely automated by what we now call computers. Right? And you, know, you don't see a lot of travel agents anymore. Um, I, I think the checkout clerks are probably not going to be around for much longer. When I go to Safeway, I can now scan all my stuff without interacting with a human. Um, but yet, we don't see a huge upswing in unemployment. And so how many, are there any economists in the audience? I'm just curious. Okay, so I'm going to bullshit like crazy about economics. I'm not an economist. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, sorry, but here's, 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 what, I, here's what I know um, from my friend in Wikipedia. There's two kinds of unemployment. There's, there's, uh, there's frictional unemployment, right, which is um, the kind of unemployment that happens because there's friction, right? It's hard to find a new job sometimes, right? It takes people a few months to get to the next job. And technology definitely helps with that. Right? There's lots of interesting companies like Odesk and Elance and Freelancer.com that let people find jobs um, faster. There's new job posting boards. I mean, information technology can definitely connect people faster. 
And I think that should mean, to, that, should mean that we allocate people quicker and there's less unemployment due to that. But there's another kind of unemployment that you would expect te technology to create a problem with, which is called structural unemployment. Right? And so I'm actually going to argue the more complicated thing, the harder thing to argue, that actually structural unemployment may go down um, with, with increased um, automation. And this graph is actually not the, the relative unemployment, but it's the size of the US labor force. Right? And so you can see that that's actually going um, up and to the right. right? It's a, I mean, we've definitely been creating jobs overall, even if unemployment's increasing. And Think about the jobs. There's, it's not just jobs like um, AI researcher that are created, right? There's jobs like uh, data entry is increasing, right? Help desk and tech support jobs are increasing. Even call center jobs in the United States are increasing despite um, the, the outsourcing trend. And I just want to put this in um, the, the kind of, bring it back to the sort of AI that I was doing. And, and I think that, that what's happening here is that we sort of always imagined, and, and a lot of AI research is always about people learning like this, right? This is actually called unstructured artificial intelligence, where you learn just like a child, right? You just feed the child information and it learns language, right? Or you feed the child two languages and now it's a translating machine, like my little cousin can translate between Spanish and English because he just knows both of those um, languages. Google Translate does not work like that, <laughs> right? <laughs> Google Translate did not just scour the web and look at some Spanish and look at some English, learn how to speak both, and <laughs> you know, just translate in its mind, right? Google Translate actually gets fed millions or billions of parallel texts. They're curated by people, right? So people actually will, will pair up the two sources, and it just looks at lots and lots of these examples. And what makes it good is the fact that it's seen more examples than any other system, right? When, when the US Post Office wanted to automate the handwriting recognition to, to route letters, they had to label millions of letters, like handwritten addresses, with the correct address that the person intended to write down. When people want to automate their phone systems, they have to collect tons and tons of um, voice data. And I, 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 like, I always have to have one ugly graph in each of my presentations, but don't be intimidated. Really, all this graph is saying, so that it's got an error rate is the, x, is the y axis, and the x axis is the amount of data it's shown. And what this graph basically shows is, OK, there's all these automation approaches, but the more data that you feed into it, the better it gets. Right? And so there's sort of an insatiable desire from all these tech companies to create more and more data so that their systems work better, so their classification systems work better, so Amazon recommendations um, can work better. And also, the bottom here is not zero error rate. It's about 20% um, error rate. And so um, call centers, even though they automate more and more stuff, it actually makes it more and more worth it for them to have people around to handle the case where it's not understanding what you're saying, and you're screaming at it, and you're now this angry customer that needs a human being to come online, right? And so automation, for example, hasn't replaced um, lots of call center jobs. It's just made people um, more efficient. And I think the, 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 my favorite example of this is this is actually a picture of our office. And this is a robot called an AnyBot. Um, and this AnyBot is actually, it's really like a segue with a video conference system on top of it, right? And they sell these as, um, as virtual receptionists, right? And so this, this person, like, halfway around the world, they can, like, drive around with, like, a joystick or a keyboard, right? And they can greet people, right? And so we were using this in our office. And I was just struck by the fact that um, I always imagined this world where it was going to be like the Jetsons, right? It was going to be like a, a robot that comes up to you and greets you. And, and we wouldn't need receptions because of that. But instead, we have this world where you can have a receptionist that might be a disabled person, or they might be a person that um, lives halfway around the world, and they can still do their job due to the kinds of systems um, that we've built. And I think all of these examples are, are ways that we can empower new kinds of people and make um, new kinds of things possible. And so these are the kind of jobs that um, I think automation creates. Thank you.